Amazing. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the country uh, of the country which we meet today. I'm currently on the land of the Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, as we're probably not all in the same country, if you'd like to type in the Zoom chat box what um, what specific country you're on, that's a great way to acknowledge um, yeah, the, the specific land that you're conducting this meeting on. So, again, thank you all for joining us. Really excited to be able to facilitate this event where we'll be discussing um, such important issues with passionate change makers and young people like yourselves. And this is our last event in the Taking Action in 2020 series. And it's been um, so fantastic and inspiring to hear from so many um, amazing change makers doing amazing things and helping create a better um, future for everyone. Um, so we've talked about climate change and we've talked about system change and gender equality and women empowerment. and this last event is going to include parts of everything that we've already talked about because the problems that um, we're facing are all connected and they have similar parts to them and understanding that is a huge um, is a huge thing when understanding what action um, is best to take. So today we're going to be talking about how to produce and consume sustainably for both our planet and the people on it. Um, as humans, we, and, and in the world we live in today, um, we are lovers of consumption and, um, but all of us here know that we can't buy our way out of the most multiple crises that we're in at the moment. Um, community action and system change are so incredibly important and such an important part of the conversation um, when we talk about uh, how, to, how to make it, create a better world for everyone. So recently sustainability and being sustainable has become fashionable and you've probably heard this term more and more. Um, and in some ways this is such a great thing because more people are talking about environmental issues and it's, it's becoming more mainstream, but um, buying multiple keep cups is not going to address the underlying very complicated systems that are causing the climate crisis or the poverty crisis. Um, so yeah, individual action is important, um, but community and system action needs to happen to create a future um, where humans and the planet can thrive. So there are really important and great ways to reduce your impact when it comes to consumption. And we're so lucky to be joined by four amazing change makers who are going to be talking about all things fashion, consumption, social enterprise, and tiny living. So I'm not gonna talk anymore and I'm gonna pass it on to Maria and Maka from the um, wonderful organization Sisterworks. Thanks so much, Eva, for the introduction. Really happy to be here today, both Maka and I, to talk about Sisterworks and explain more about what we're all about. So I will share my screen. We have a PowerPoint presentation to sort of accompany what we'll say. So bear with me a second while I do that. And let me know if you can see it. All good. Alrighty, I'll jump right into it then. So yeah, as I said, we're going to talk about Sisterworks. Maka and I both work at Sisterworks. So Sisterworks is a non-for-profit social enterprise. We're based in Melbourne. Through work and entrepreneurship, our mission is to support women who are refugees, asylum seekers or migrants to improve their confidence, mental well-being, sense of belonging and economic outlook. Our vision is an Australia where all migrant women are given opportunities to become economically empower empowered and we're grounded in the belief that work empowers women. But what is a social enterprise? Social, a social enterprise, in essence, is a business that produces and sells goods with the purpose of tackling social problems. This includes improving your communities, providing training and employment opportunities, or helping your environment. The money that you make as a business is invested into a social purpose. 
and at SisterWorks, this is the empowerment of our migrant, refugee and asylum seeker women. So migrant women are some of our community's most vulnerable. When they arrive as newcomers, they face many challenges, such as language barriers, social isolation, and responsibilities to look after their family that in many cases can get in the way of them integrating within a new society. There are many numerous complex circumstances that arise and prevent them from developing employment and educational opportunities. So that's where SisterWorks jumps in. We transition our women, who we call our sisters, through training workshops where they learn how to hand make products such as homeware, body care, accessories and food. And as they transition through our programs, a lot of our women are then inspired to pursue their own independent brands and become their own entrepreneurs to make their own money. And we sell all these products in a retail store that we have in Richmond, as well as many pop-up markets around Melbourne and a SisterWorks online shop. At SisterWorks, our women are our business partners. They develop and sell products with at least 50 to 75% of profits coming directly back to the woman that has made the product. And then the rest is reinvested into the broader group and our support programs. The core of our programs is a model of learning by doing. This includes how to work, teaching our sisters how to work effectively in an Australian climate and in an Australian market, whilst earning money for themselves, improving their English language and developing business skills. All this magic happens in our empowerment hubs. So we have our main hub in Richmond, as well as a newly opened one in Bendigo with a broader vision to expand nationwide. One of our greatest success factors at SisterWorks is our social impact. As newly arrived migrants, there's a challenging experience of social isolation. We have many women who have left everybody behind in their home country to start a new life in Australia. Their social and support network has essentially vanished for them. So SisterWorks comes into their life as a safe, friendly and nurturing space filled with other women who've experienced similar challenges we share knowledge, we lift each other, and together we grow. And to date, we've supported over 800 women from over 56 different countries, so champions of diversity and inclusivity. So I'm gonna pass it along to Maka now, and she'll expand on our social enterprise and what ethical production means at SisterWorks. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Macarena and I am the production and process engineer at SisterWorks. I am in charge of the production and the product development for the SisterWorks label brand. So I'm from Chile, from South America, and I came to Australia four years ago as a migrant with low English and confidence. And SisterWorks gave me the opportunity to be part of the organization and grow in it. As Maria explained before, we support the most vulnerable community of migrants. Most of these women don't have craft skills when they join sister works, but they learn with us, like sewing, cooking, knitting, stamping, and other crafts. Some of them, they don't have good English, so we teach them with the learning by doing methodology, which is we do it first, and then they copy us. This way of doing things has allowed us to accept any women, regardless of their English level, confidence, and background. So we are an organization open to help anyone who is in need. To make all that possible and give the women the support they need, we work with students that they need to do the work experience, placements, or internships, and they are an incredible help for us. Um, and we have a lot of volunteers that want to give back to the community uh, by teaching or supporting the women during their learning experience. In the last two years, uh, we have been building a strong brand with high quality standards to be able to compete in the Australian market. Every product that we create is handmade with love in Melbourne by refugees and migrant women. 
At SisterWorks, we are very conscious about the environment. And when we create our line of products, we wanted reusable and natural products. We are the generation for the change, and it was extremely important for us to align ourselves to reduce waste, especially single use of plastic and paper. On the other hand, we wanted to reduce the high level of consumption and throwing away by creating long lasting products with high quality materials. This is how we created a, our reusable line which is free from toxic and nasty ingredients. We have beeswax, produce bags, bread bags, sandwich wraps, hemp products. Everything is made by the women, depending on the skills they have. And we also make a preserved food, like jams and salsa, and we make candles. Um, during COVID, because this year has been very special for all of us, we realized the importance of having a mask, a reusable mask, and we started to produce them in early March. Thanks to that product and our constant effort for good quality uh, and the great sales of the mask helped us to keep supporting the women and their family during this uh, hard time. Our way of working uh, is the women come to our premises and we teach them how to make the product. But in the COVID time, we needed to change our business model very fast because we needed to make sure the women were safe at home. So we organized all our logistics and we pack every material for them and we drop them in their houses and the next week we collected the masks. Um, we receive a lot of donations for fabric, so most of our masks were made by fabric donated for the, from the community. And to give able to give instructions and support during the process, understanding the uh, lack of English and everything, we communicated using face calls, photos, and messages. And this also improved the technological skills of the women. So thanks to the mask, we were able uh, to reach more women uh, that have been in Australia for a very long time, some of them 10 or 15 years. But because of the lack of English and opportunities, they have been isolated in their communities. Most of the women, when they come here, they come as a mom. So they, their children learn English much faster than them. So in some way they use the children as a translator and they are behind like at home uh, doing like home chores. So SisterWorks bring us a lot of beautiful stories. And we have some women that have been, uh, that have been able to leave chain houses and move to a private house thanks to the job opportunities at SisterWorks. We also have other women that have come to Australia with no English, but they are very active and they want to do more than just cleaning and taking uh, care of the children at home. And when they start coming to Sister Works, they look happier and they feel they are useful again. They have stories to tell to their friends and they have this sense of belonging in this country, which is very, very important to transfer to the next generation. So thanks very much for giving us the opportunity to share who we are with all of you. Yeah, thank you very much. And if we leave you with a final call to action after explaining what SisterWex is and the value of social enterprises, we know that in this climate, you can sometimes feel a bit disempowered and that the social issues of, our, of today's environment are quite heavy on your shoulders. But we just want to remind you guys that there are so many amazing social enterprise and community organisations out there that are doing fabulous work for local and broader communities. And if you want to support and do your part, it can be as simple as spreading the word. Let your friends and family know about social enterprises like SisterWorks that are out there. 
follow us on our social media pages. You can even volunteer your time if you have the means or now being in the holiday season, making a little purchase from a social enterprise is, is very valuable because you'll be giving them direct resources to expand on their social impact. So that's all from us. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Maureen Macca. That was so great. Um, yeah, you've created such a community of change and empowerment. And like you just said, Maria, especially coming up to the Christmas period, it's so important that um, we do support social enterprises who are doing such amazing things. And it is a way that you can consume in this time um, sustainably and ethically and um, support people who who need it the most. So thank you so much. Um, next you. up we have Elf, um, who's going to talk about tiny living. You're on mute, Elf. Okay, can everybody hear me? I am okay. Excellent. So apologies in advance, everyone. I do have a bit of a lag on my computer, but I, um, yeah, we'll see how we roll. Um, thank you, Eva, for the kind introduction. Much appreciated. And thank you for having me. Um, pleasure to be involved with such an amazing group of people. I'm just going to quickly share my presentation. Do give me a nudge if it doesn't show up. Sometimes with the lag, it doesn't. Okay. How's that? Is it okay? Yes, winning. Okay, so hi everyone. My name's Elle Payton. I'm from an organization called Tiny Nonprofit. Tiny Nonprofit is a project focused advocacy group for tiny houses here in Australia. So we've been involved in a lot of different projects, but for um, for today, I'm just going to be sharing a little about my personal journey and about our current project. I'll share a link at the end if you're interested in all of um, the other things we've been involved with. Uh, yeah, so tiny nonprofit. Um, I've got a lot to share, so I'm just going to jump straight in. So, what is a tiny house? So, a tiny house is a movable dwelling up to 50 square meters that are suitable for long-term residential use. There are two types, a tiny house on skids and a tiny house on wheels that are better known in the industry as a tho. Um, so what are the advantages of those and what are we campaigning for? So um, the small environmental footprint and the use of less resources when housing people. Uh, we'll create more housing options in an overstretched market. Um, they're flexible, they can be placed in many different locations and styles of locations. They can be off-grid, on-grid or a combination of both. Uh, they're designed for long-term occupancy. Unlike the old school caravans, these are more built more like a traditional house and lend themselves to traditional housing rather than a caravan type model. But those on wheels are very much, um, uh, that's the wheels are probably the only link to caravans. A lot of people get them confused, but they're a very different thing. Um, they're efficient designs, they're efficient lifestyles. Uh, they can be a stepping stone to owning real estate in a market where a lot of people are being are very much priced out. Um, they're more affordable with a quick build time. So why tiny homes for me? So for me personally, uh, I was originally motivated by environmental reasons. As I Got further into my journey, I started noticing the um, learning more about housing issues and understanding the link. As Eva was saying earlier, that all of these issues, environmental issues, are linked. So I started to understand what homeless uh, that homelessness is very much an uh, environmental issue as well as a social issue. If we think about it, the somebody on the streets is forced into a single use life, single use lifestyle. As in, they've got no place to wash something like a keeper cup, um, and they're not going to carry around um, dirty dishes and things like that. So yeah, the, their situation is an environmental issue as much as a social one. Um, so I met up with a friend of mine called Jan Stewart, 
and uh, we were discussing that homelessness is an environmental issue. We, we were discussing at the time this research done by Melbourne University where they, at that time, and unfortunately these numbers have grown since, um, uh, since then, that was about what, three years ago now, but on any given night there's over 116,000 people on the streets here in Australia with no place to stay. And that was a 14% increase in five years up until that point, which is quite alarming, especially if there's going, the homelessness issue is going to grow, keep growing at that rate. Um, in that research, they discovered that it costs $85,000 per year for one homeless person on the streets, and that including all of the welfare services, the emergency services, um, uh, the last resort uh, housing, all of those types of things, which didn't make sense to it sense to us when it costs 60,000 for a very basic level tiny house. So with 140,000 plus people on social housing waiting lists, uh, we're very aware that this is an emerging, um, not only is it a crisis now, but it's very rapidly growing crisis that has a lot of, um, not only is it going to do a lot of damage to us socially, but it's also going to do a lot of damage to our environment unless we start doing stuff about it. And the housing system is badly failing many Australians. So with that, we thought we put our money where our mouth is and uh, built a tiny non-profit and um, have been living, breathing, <laughs> walking tiny houses ever since. Um, so yeah, my, a bit about my personal journey other than my motivators. Um, I decided at that point I absolutely wanted to put my personal money where my mouth is. Um, I started thinking about what did I need to have a high quality life in that type of space uh, and could my version of a high quality life get into a small space. Um, I was a little bit hesitant until I came uh, across this tiny house. This tiny house is uh, called the Alpha Tiny House built by New Frontier Tiny Homes in the US. And in this tiny house, they, they have the capacity to entertain quite a few people and I'm very social. As soon as I found out that I could entertain as well as fit all my stuff I was okay I'm sold I mean hook line and sinker I was uh, all for it but I didn't know where to start so uh, I took myself off to do some workshops and had an amazing five-day workshop with this beautiful group of people here we jumped on the tools we learned to build um, a tiny house a very basic one but that that little one down the bottom there with the blue door, blue door was the final outcome um, charming little one. And that is now used for a accommodation for a worker on an organic farm up in the Macedon Ranges, which was quite a lovely output of that workshop. Um, I started tiny touring, both here in Australia and in the US. Um, and the more I saw, the more I became addicted. Um, and my friends got sick of me talking about tiny houses. So when I go back from the US, um, I wanted to see how cheaply a tiny house could be built. Well, not such a tiny house, but a tiny, lockable, safe, warm room could be built for uh, um, using as many recycled uh, products as we could. So my target was 65% recycled materials. Uh, the result was a warm, comfortable uh, room made with approximately 63% recycled and salvaged materials. Um, the reason I came in a little bit under is I wasn't prepared to compromise on structural integrity in order to um, create create this space. But for a five and a half thousand dollar price point, this sh shows that you could actually put somebody in a safe, warm, lockable space at a very, very low cost and get people off the streets into a secure spot. So um, why do others go tiny? Enough about me. Um, <laughs> look, there are many, many reasons, so I'm only going to list a few for the sake of time. Um, obviously, environmental footprint is huge in the target um, in the target audience with tiny houses. Um, as we've mentioned, housing, rental, and mortgage stress. Some people are changing careers in their, um, or direction in their life, and they don't they, they want to take their houses with them. Um, the workforce is becoming more and more nomadic. And rather than move to a new house, buy furniture that suits that house, get rid of all the old furniture that they had in the old house, or um, some people just want to take their houses with them. Um, many people are downsizing after uh, after their kids leave home. They don't need that much space anymore, and they're still cleaning spaces that they don't actually use. So downsizing is huge in that. This one is massive. Um, 
I manage a Facebook group called Australian Tiny Houses um, and I've seen and we ask questions on why everyone's signing up to that group and asking to be involved. Um, the conscious consuming is just going up and up as a reason for people to get involved in tiny houses, which really personally excites me. Um, people want to gain a time, experience and have more freedom. They don't want to be living to work. Uh, they want to work to live <laughs> and so they don't want to go and work jobs where they're spending um, 80 hours a week to pay off a home that they're hardly ever in and have no life because they're too exhausted. So people are starting to flip that value now and uh, examine what they need and use. Uh, they can be financially motivated, uh, they're interested in emergency housing and they just want to simplify life. They want to do and be more with less. So other applications for tiny house, age-friendly design. I personally love this idea. I like the idea of somebody not going into a nursing home prematurely, but rather having a unit in the back of somebody's property, as this is a friend of mine's place here, her name's Merle, and she lives out the back of her mother's place. Um, they've made it wheelchair accessible all of the way through um, and designed with her future life in mind, but also designed so that she can stay with her family for as long as possible. Uh, they found that people who are going to nursing homes uh, tend to degrade far more rapidly. So keeping people with their, connected to their family and closest to, uh, close to the life they had actually uh, enhances well-being and connection to the local community around them. Uh, living carers and workers for farms. This is the uh, this is the farm in the Massey Ranges that I mentioned before. Um, and these, these tiny houses are used for wolfers um, who come in, volunteer, learn about organic gardening, um, do a little bit of work, get free accommodation and go again, which I think is an amazing setup. Um, tourism, um, all standard, Airbnb, eco and agricultural tourism, tiny touring, tiny house hotels. Not yet, but we're, there's something in the, um, in the works on uh, the first Australian tiny house hotel which I'm hoping to be a part of, fingers crossed. Um, student and teacher accommodation, temporary high quality living. Uh, intentional communities. Now these are popping up everywhere despite some barriers with um, uh, councils and legislation. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of people are gathering to build these things and nudging legislation uh, uh, in the direction that they want it to. They're campaigning against local councils when our local councils have an emerging homelessness. Um, situation and they're not doing anything about it and rather than complain about that people are coming in with proactive choices and challenging councils and key decision makers to create more housing in their local environment which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, current projects, uh, how am I going for time? Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'll just keep rolling. All right, share, share the project because it's amazing. So take take as much time as you need. Okay, thank you. All right, so the t my current project uh, is a tiny house community garden project. Uh, this is a live-in uh, experiment, a demonstration project designed to prove that not only can tiny houses be a viable form of housing, but they can be of service to the community in a way of educating, inspiring and engaging people to live a more sustainable lifestyle. At the moment, unfortunately, the community garden has been on hold to, due to COVID, uh, but we've been working hard developing the space um, while, we're, while we're waiting. But yeah, um, uh, there's a link at the end if you're keen to follow, um, follow the progress of that to tap into that link. Um, yeah, so we donated a piece of land. And when I say hot mess, this is... Um, yeah, this is just an example of, uh, of what was on this land. This land was an 850 square metre block. Um, it was riddled with plastic. Uh, I don't know how many thousands of bottles because it had been used as a hardy pad. Um, it was a very dangerous environment. The, uh, the community was sick of this eyesore. Um, the pests involved um, were both human and rodent-like. <laughs> so we've done, the, we've done a lot of cleaning up of the of the space. I have to say, when I took this on, I was incredibly excited. Who gets 850 square meters um, donated for their project to use? Uh, for any nonprofit, that's just that oh, mind blown, absolutely brilliant. But then, um, then when I had to get practical, I was completely overwhelmed. Thank goodness I had the most amazing community around me. 
Um, and I learned to ask for help at a whole different level. Um, I learned to tap into um, people and surround myself with people who were like-minded in their value system. Um, because this would not have come together without that. Um, and how I'm hand on heart, absolutely grateful for all of the wonderful people in my life that put their heads together and worked hard on this project. So that's a little bit of the development. While we were cleaning up the land, we were also building a tiny house up at the Yarra Valley, ECOS, which is a sustainability park, obviously, in the Yarra Valley. A uh, great group of people. That's Nick there. He's designing it. Designing it. They're our partners, Tiny House to Go. This je um, that gentleman there in the checker shirt, um, that's Rick Butler, a very dear friend of mine, who also does a lot of great uh, work with the Australian Tiny House Association. So we've um, we've got a lot of ties across the tiny house industry through that connection as well. Uh, just we started transforming the land. You can see there how far it's come. Um, we're um, learning very rapidly about biodiversity, what plant species to bring into the space. Um, I have put a couple of plants in that I have rinsed out since though, because um, yeah, I probably would have had more guidance if I had it not been for COVID, but you know, you learn as you go, it's fine. Um, yeah, and then the tiny house went in in March. Now this tiny house is uh, built on a triaxial trailer. It's completely off grid. Um, composting toilet, this land has never had any lines, plumbing lines or electrical lines coming into it. So um, the only way to go to, uh, and the way I wanted to go was completely off grid. Having said that, I am not completely fossil fuel free. Um, I do use gas for hot water uh, and, and for cooking. Uh, thankfully though, I eat mostly raw, so uh, not using up too much uh, gas to put it in my mouth, you know. So um, that's the tiny house. Just a little snapshot of what, um, what it looks like on the inside there. There's the composting toilet in the centre there. Um, down the end there in the first shot, you can see that there's a big couch. That bed rolls that, that rolls out into a big, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a, a double, uh, sorry, probably more like a queen a queen bed. I never know what, quite, like what size it is, but that rolls out. Um, it has all this nifty storage all the way throughout. I have everything I need and more. Um, and since moving into the tiny house, um, I'm finding a lot less and less. I don't want the freedom from stuff. Um, I've had the pleasure of sharing this space with quite a few people now, uh, obviously very in a very limited way due to COVID. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to opening the space up to more and more people. Um, so how can you start living, uh, living smaller and have a tiny footprint? Uh, make sure you only buy what you need and do well. Try to buy from ethical suppliers and avoid using, uh, avoid purchasing single-use items. Learn more about the minimalistic diet lifestyle. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and donate as much as possible. Buy local and learn how to grow some of your own food. Every little bit matters. Um, practice water saving and power saving techniques. Think about what you are putting down the sink. That matters far more than what we think it does. Even if you are just something as simple as cooking meat. And putting and washing your fry pan, putting it down the sink in in a setup like this, this that can affect the ecology around um, around your tiny house or in your environment quite a bit. So it's worth considering that um, before you buy anything. Ask yourself: Will this last me a long time? Will I love it in five years' time? Is this item useful? Do I really, really need this? <laughs> um, can I borrow this short term from somebody else? if I'm only going to use it a few times before me, uh, and before I no longer need it. So yeah, I'd like to leave it on. How would you like to be different if you had more time, more savings, more experiences, more connection, more passion, more relaxation, more clarity. And I'd like to just remind people that living tiny is not a new thing for something I really think is worth rediscovering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elle. That was so fantastic. I'm convinced I'm going to live in a tiny house now. So great. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> and um, I think what you said about how all these huge problems are connected um, and we need solutions that recognise that, I think that's a really important takeaway. 
um, and something that we should all keep in mind when we're taking action. So last but not least, I'm gonna pass it over to Lil, who's our last speaker for today. Hello, I'm just gonna upload, let's see if this works. Okay, can everyone see that? <laughs> Verbal confirmation, please. <laughs> You're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Lily Callanan. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm a student at RMIT in the Bachelor of Fashion and Textiles, um, Sustainable Innovation. And briefly, um, I just want to talk a little bit how, about how I came to get into this field. Um, from a really young age, probably like mid-primary school, I got really interested in like crafts, knitting, sewing, um, embroidery, especially through my grandmother. And eventually I started building up an interest in how exactly our clothes were made and what processes were involved in making them that was actually really harmful to the environment and to the people. Um, so from then I um, enrolled in this amazing course that I'm doing now that is a new one. Um, and yeah. So what are textiles? <laughs> textiles are basically flexible. They can also be hard, but most of the time they're flexible materials that are made from thread or fibers. Now, thread are kind of long bits of string that maybe you've seen your grandma knitting with, and fibers are the tiny little hairs that are spun together to make these long bits of thread. Um, once you've made this, they can be woven, knitted, felted or bonded together that makes these big, long, beautiful sheets of fabric that we use to make our clothes. And what's fashion? <laughs> Lifelong question. Uh, basically, it's clothing. It's apparel, um, our primary form of shelter, protecting us from weather. Um, and also, it can be used for really specialised things. So certain textiles are engineered for spe specific purposes. For example, a firefighter's um, uniform, really amazing inventions there with textiles um, and weather. Um, but fashion's also this idea of style, and I'll be coming back to this a little bit later, but this idea of um, what's fashionable and what's stylish, I think, um, may not necessarily have um, much, uh, I guess it's not really helpful in our idea of sustainability because as the fashion industry is structured at the moment, um, it's kind of set into these small um, kind of timeframes of what is fashionable and then we move on to the next thing. So what is in our clothes? Our clothes can be made from so many different things, almost infinite number of things. Um, but some of them are made from natural sources. So these are plants and animals. We might have seen cotton t-shirts, some linen, a nice woolly jumper or a silk scarf. And I've put natural in quotation marks because it's interesting to identify the fact that although something might come from a natural source, may not mean that it's actually good for the environment. Because a lot of the time, um, how our clothes are processed kind of um, cancels out the benefit that it um, has coming from a natural source. And then the other type of um, fibre are synthetic uh, or man-made, coming from man-made sources. And these are basically petrochemicals or plastics. Um, and we might see on our clothes tags that they're polyester, they're called acrylic, nylon or lycra, all different fibres, but we can see that in our swimmers, we can see them in our exercise leggings, um, also in our polar fleece jumpers, um, they're all from synthetic fibres. And all of our clothes can be made from a blend or entirely from one material. So we can identify this through the tag that we get um, on our new clothes. Um, and it's also important to remember that other parts make up our clothes, like the thread that might be a different material to what the rest of the garment's made of, uh, like something like shoelaces, buttons, zips, stuffing, and so many other things. And these uh, we tend to not think of, but these actually pose a little bit of a problem when we're wanting to recycle something, which is basically the ideal situation um, at the end of life of our stuff. 
So to evaluate how um, ethical and how sustainable something can be, we need to look at the whole supply chain. So that um, kind of starts at the birth of the product, so maybe the growing of the fibre or the extracting of the chemicals, and then it goes all the way to after use, once we're finished with it, what happens with it. Um, so we can see a little graphic of um, all of the kind of impacts that, or some of the impacts that um, these stages can have on the environment. Um, so what impact does fashion have on the environment? As you saw in the last slide, um, each stage can have diverse number of um, impacts, but let's use the example of a cotton t-shirt. Everyone's got one. <laughs> Um, so to begin, we have to farm and grow the cotton, which requires heaps of water and a lot of um, pesticides, which are really harmful chemicals um, for humans and for the land. And there are all these um, implications using these pesticides. They can float on the wind and actually get into other farms that might be farming food, which can be really harmful to the people eating that food. And also they can be inhaled by workers and they can be washed away in waterways or absorbed into the soil. So all of those things have massive impacts on the biodiversity. Um, now, once the cotton's harvested, it gets processed, it gets brushed and spun and all of these things into fabric. Once the fabric's made, it's cut, sewn, da 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 dyed, um, which is highly um, uh, labour and energy intensive. And then once we get it, after it's been transported to us, probably across the globe, um, we wear it and what we do with our items actually has a fair bit of impact on the overall um, kind of consequence of this item. So how much we wash it, if we look after it, do we mend it or fix it um, if it's holy or broken? Um, and also what we do at the end of life. So how do we get rid of it? How do we dispose of it? Do we give it to a friend? Um, do we give it to the up shop? Do we just chuck it out in the rubbish? Um, or do we upcycle it or recycle it um, somehow? And along with environmental impacts, there are so many impacts on the people making our clothes. Um, 3.4 billion people worldwide work in this industry, and most of these are women. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of these instances, these women are getting paid well below the poverty line, and they're actually needing to feed their children and their families. Um, and this can lead to poor and unsafe conditions, minimal rights, and needing to work overtime. And this makes these jobs really, really dangerous for these workers. And we can see an accumulation of this in the Rana Plaza factory collapse, which some of you might be a bit young to remember, um, but it happened in Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh, which is where a lot of our clothing production comes from. Um, and basically the, the factory was structurally unstable and the workers weren't given enough uh, safe enough work conditions. So this factory collapsed and people couldn't get out in time because there weren't enough exits or the exits were actually locked. And over a thousand people died and it really shook up the entire industry and people started thinking, actually, how can we change um, the structure of this to find out who actually made our clothes and to pressure the brands to change their um, supply chains or improve their um, ethical standards. So all of these kind of link into a deeper problem that a lot of the wonderful speakers today have touched on. Um, and that's the fact that we live in a really materialistic society. So this means that many people buy way too much than what they actually need. Um, and instead, I propose um, that we learn to value our clothes and textiles like an old friend. Um, I still have my teddy bear from when I was born um, and I've recently mended him so he looks a little bit like this one to the right. Um, but when we have an emotional attachment to something, we value it more um, and we're less likely to throw it away so it improves or it um, kind of Longate, elongates the life si lifespan of this item and then therefore it becomes more sustainable because we're using it for longer. So what can we do in this? <laughs> um, first off, we can buy less. We can help spread the word, contact brands, join groups and organise different events. So by buying less, 
Um, the most sustainable clothes are the ones that we already own, the ones are already in our cupboards. So we can fix, we can mend, change or individualise what we have already. And this helps to lower the environmental impact that our clothes have and also the social and um, ethical impact. Um, you don't need to follow trends or buy in fashion. Um, I kind of adopted this very early on, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, but I'm very daggy. And I think that particularly as a teen, you want to fit in, you want to um, kind of look like one in the crowd, but um, maybe I ask that you consider to really own your style and to love what you have already. And if you don't love something, maybe you can fix it up in a way that makes you really do. Um, but if you do need something, you can always get it secondhand, you can borrow it from someone, rent it, or you can swap clothes. <laughs> I love swapping clothes with my friends. Um, Eva can attest to that. Um, and that's always a good alternative to buying new. Um, you can spread the word about the impacts of the fashion industry. Not many people actually know much about it and all of the complexities um, that come with the different stages. So when you find something out, tell your friends and family about what you know and encourage them to learn more and share that information. Uh, by pooling effort, knowledge and resources, we can really effectively um, act as a, as a group and that will lead to lots of change. Um, we can also contact brands. Now, this is a little bit of a daunting one, um, but don't be shy. We can always ask brands who made my clothes. If you're buying from them, they actually have a responsibility to tell you because you're a consumer and you deserve to know because you're spending money on them. So quiz them. You can be harsh harsh but um, respectful, um, about their ethical and environmental standards in their supply chain. And actually, once you've, once, if they um, reply, you can email them back with some more detailed questions about how often they look into their factories um, and what their standards are and what the people who are making your clothes are actually getting paid. Um, you can email them or you can contact them on social media. It can be a short thing. Now you can also join the movement, <laughs> a vague term, but powerful nonetheless. Um, Fashion Revolution are a big um, kind of organization about uh, transparency into fashion supply chains. And they have a big week in April where they encourage people to do different actions to um, promote this idea. So you can also attend talks um, and get active and creative at school. Um, I'm sure that your school community would be really interested to know about maybe where your uniforms are made or um, what's, what is in them, you know, what materials they're made of. You can always look that up. Um, it would be really interesting to find out. And last but not least, organizing events. So you could organize a clothes swap or a film screening, a mend party or a craft afternoon, or of course a workshop teaching these kinds of skills because not everyone knows them. Um, and that's a good way to, to practice um, and to have a social gathering as well to promote this. So thank you for listening. Here are some more resources that um, maybe I'll send the links to the YouTube so that those who are watching um, can see, but I hope that leaves you with a bit of hope <laughs> and inspiration. Um, let me stop. There we go. Thank you so much, Lil. That was so great. Um, I think, yeah, you made so many great points, but adding the emotional attachment to things and to clothes you own is um, a really great way to look at, look at what you have and not just treat your clothes like they mean nothing to you because that's when um yeah those environmental and social impacts and consequences become even larger and um i think a common thread from all the speakers the just how interconnected these problems are when you were talking about the runner plaza and talking about women's rights and human rights and social justice and environmental issues um yeah it's been really great that we've got to see this huge web of problems that are all interconnected. Um, so we only have a few minutes left, but I do want to ask each speaker or speakers, yeah, just one question. Uh, unfortunately, your answer can't be too long, but um, 
we've got some really interesting questions here. Um, if you need to go at 5.30, feel free to, to jump off and you can always watch the YouTube video after. But I might ask Sister Works, we've got one question that is, why do sustainable items tend to be more expensive than other items that are not eco-friendly? Okay, Maka, you might know a little bit more about this being involved in production. Maybe if you can jump in and... Yeah, the, um, I think that is very related with uh, what Lily talked about, about the payment, especially. So when you buy um, ethically fabric, uh, the price that they pay to the labor is higher than the price that you pay in a Bangladesh or Chinese factory and the conditions are better. So everything is added. And the other reason is we pay 50% of the profit to the women who made our products. So that is the reason why our products are a little bit more expensive than um, another product that you uh, find like made by a factory. And we made everything by hand too. So is different the time that you you use. Yeah. Amazing. And um I think we'll we'll send out some resources after um following this Zoom in the next few days, which we'll have more information on on that question because it's such a huge question. Um but yeah thank you Maka for that. Um okay L what is the best and worst things about living tiny? Uh, the worst thing was moving into the tiny house and less than a week later going straight into lockdown. Not only did my wall shrink from a two-bedroom apartment into a 20-square-metre uh, dwelling, it also shrunk a lot further than that. I was very much reliant on the cafes and the socialising and all that living you do outside the home to help me adjust. So that was very, very challenging. Um, the best thing... Um, I, I was concerned I was going to miss a lot of the stuff that I got rid of. I got rid of um, so many of my possessions uh, and I thought that I would experience lack. It, it's been quite the opposite. I have learned how little I need and how much um, freeing myself from those possessions streamlines my life and forces me to live in accordance with my values. I think about how much water I'm using. I think about how much power I'm using. I'm thinking about what I'm putting into the garden before I purchase something, I'm thinking about what I'm bringing in, bringing in. And I put myself in a position where it forces me to live a way that's in accordance with my values, which I think is um, it's good for me as an individual. Um, but yeah, getting gaining that, uh, that freedom back, I had no idea how much time I was wasting by just having stuff around me. Such a waste of time, wow. Um, so yeah, feeling very uh, yeah. grateful about that. Oh, just quickly, one of the worst things about um, living in a tiny house is a lot of people who it doesn't necessarily fit their model and their values. Um, yeah, occasionally people look at you with pity and it's like, actually, no, I proactively chose this lifestyle. Don't pity me. Be, very, like, be happy for me. This is exactly what I want. So, yeah, um, that's a bit of a shame to even have to entertain the conversation sometimes. But, but it's all right. I can deal with that. It's not a problem. <laughs> Bring it on. If I can plan a seed, then I plan a seed. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and Lil, quickly, this is a huge question, so have fun answering it in 30 seconds. But um, what is greenwashing? This term we are hearing more and more. Good question. Um, greenwashing basically is this idea of advertising that brands use to kind of target the people who want to be sustainable and who want to shop to their values, but maybe they don't have the resources to actually understand all of the things that um, go into making a sustainable product and making it sustainable. Um, so greenwashing is kind of a very clever marketing strategy used by plenty of brands um, to give the impression that something is sustainable when it's not in fact. And we can see that in, I saw it recently in a bin bag, something bin bags at like Woolies or something. And um, it said that it was degradable 
um, and it had green packaging and made from, you know, look like recycled cardboard. And you look into it a little bit and degradable just means that it breaks into tiny little pieces and can get into our waterways a little bit easier than a big plastic bag. So it's important, um, yeah, if you can to kind of research and nut out the things that they're claiming and if they're true. Thank you so much. And we'll we'll also include a bit about greenwashing in the um, resources that we send out. But thank you so much all for being here today. It's been so great and inspiring as always to hear from all of our speakers. And over the last three events, um, it's also been really hopeful, um, especially in a time that has been incredibly tough to know that there are still so many passionate people out there doing amazing things. So thank you to all of our speakers and thank you to everyone who came today. And um, we will send out the resources in the next um, few days 